And now I'd like to call to order the June 5th, 2019 formal meeting of the Phoenix City Council. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilman DeCicio? Councilwoman Guevara? Here. Councilwoman Mendoza? Here. Councilman Nowakowski? Here. Councilwoman Pastor? Here. Councilwoman Stark? Here. Councilwoman Williams? Here. Vice Mayor Waring? Here. Mayor Gallego? Here. The meeting minutes of the January 9th meeting were submitted to Councilman DeCicio for review. In his absence, we will go straight to a motion to approve Mayor and City Council boards and commission nominations. Move to approve Mayor as revised. And second. Board and commission nominations. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. All those. I should, add, I should add as revised. Yes, and the Vice Mayor made very clear it was as revised. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Congratulations to our new boards and commissions members. We will now swear them in. I state your name. Do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution and laws of the state of Arizona. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same and defend them against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And that, I will faithfully and impartially and that I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of the office of according to the best of my ability. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. We have an interpreter here today for, member, uh, for members of the audience. Would you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Mayor. My name is Mario Barajas. I'm gonna be serving as uh, this afternoon's uh, Spanish interpreter. I'm gonna be making a brief announcement in Spanish uh, for our Spanish speakers. Buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Mario Barajas. Yo voy a estar sirviendo como el intérprete de español. Si acaso necesitar el servicio de intérprete, uh, para la sesión de esta tarde podrán acudir a cualquier miembro del personal de la ciudad hacia la parte de atrás para que le puedan proveer los aparatos para la interpretación. Gracias. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. I would ask the city clerk to read the 24-hour paragraph. The titles of the following ordinance and resolution numbers on the agenda were available to the public at least 24 hours prior to this council meeting and therefore may be read by title or agenda item only. Ordinances numbered G6583, 6591 through 6599, S45680 through 45781, and resolutions 21748 through 21754. Thank you so much. Councilmember DeCicio, did you have time to review the meeting minutes of our January 9th meeting? I did, and I moved their approval. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. And now, Vice Mayor, do we have a motion on our liquor license applications? Move to approve items three through 14, except item 14. All, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Item 14 is in Councilwoman Guevara's district. Uh, we have two cards on the item, one from a neighborhood association and one from the applicant, and we'll turn it over to the Councilwoman. I would say 
say listen to the case first and then yeah, I would do sure, we'll have uh, staff give a presentation first, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Jenny Lingenroth with the City Clerk, and with me today is Bob Smith with the Prosecutor's Office. The request is for a new Series 10 beer and wine store license for Medlock Market in Delhi. This location was previously licensed for liquor sales and does not have an interim permit. One letter and one petition with two valid signatures protesting the issuance of this license have been received and are on file in the office of the city clerk. This le the letter is from the Sevilla Neighborhood Association and the petition is from local residents. Staff recommends disapproval of this application based on neighborhood protest. Oh, thank you. Um, and with that, I'm going to move to disapprove item 14 based on neighborhood protest. A motion to we have a motion and a second. Uh, we have two cards. Should we go ahead and take those? Uh, we have first the applicant followed by Lori Fitzhugh. So if we could ask Mr. Rabad, the applicant, to come forward. And you have two minutes. No problem. My name is Sayal Rabadi. Uh, I'm the applicant. Uh, the store was previously a liquor, uh, had a Series 10 license there. And, you know, uh, we don't have anywhere in the neighborhood that is a reliable store around us with fresh fruits and vegetables. And, uh, you know, I'm just simply doing a, a, a convenient uh, family store, you know, a neighborhood family store. And that's what I'm looking to do. Uh, Lori Fitzhugh is the the neighborhood association lady, her, her main concern is oversaturation. Uh, my store fits all the criteria of getting uh, one of these licenses, so um, I've been working with her for the past two months to figure out what we're gonna do, and I'm just, I'm here to see what you guys want us to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lori Fitzhugh. Mayor and Council Members, I'm Laurie Fitzhugh, the designated spokesperson for this liquor application from the Sevilla Neighborhood Association. Our address is P.O. Box 11153, Phoenix, Arizona, 85061. 1153. Uh, I want to extend my appreciation to the applicant for meeting with me. I found our conversations very sincere, but as I told Mr. Rabadi, I did an audit of all the liquor licenses, five categories within a two mile radius of this proposed location, which had been closed sufficient in time that it is eligible to be considered as a new liquor license location. And I audited the tens, the nines, the twelves, the sixes, and the sevens based on the fact they could all sell packaged alcohol to go, which is similar to a 10. And in that two and a half, that two mile radius, I found 87. I was quite frankly shocked. This location is Medlock, which is about the first street north of Camelback Road and the intersection of 43rd Avenue, the Grand Avenue overpass, and most importantly, the Santa Fe Railroad right of way South of the Santa Fe Grand Avenue Railroad right-of-way area is largely industrial commercial warehouse zoning. So I want to emphasize these 87 licenses aren't evenly scattered in that two-mile radius. It's more like looking at an image of a shotgun discharge all north, the majority of them north of Grand Avenue. So I believe this meets the standard for oversaturation. Based on that, we are asking this application to be recommended for disapproval. Thank you. Thank you. Any council member comments? Roll call. DeCicio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Gallego? Yes. Passes unanimously. City Clerk, are we ready for ordinances, resolutions, new business, and planning and zoning? Yes. Vice Mayor? Motion to approve items 15 through 178, except the following, 24, 
35, 41, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, and 51, 53, 54, and 55, 73, 76, 82, 84, 120, 152, 167, 174, 177, and 178 will be pulled out and it'll be revised when we vote on it. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. DeCicio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Item 24 is a lawsuit settlement. We have one card from the uh, from Jarrett Maupin. Move to approve item 24. Second. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council, new Mayor, very exciting. Um, I came down today, I'm in favor of, of the item and I hope that uh, you all are too. It's very sad uh, when we have to pay out hundreds of thousands of dollars to people who uh, have suffered the death of a loved one, a wrongful death at the hands of our police department. And that's why I wanted to come down and speak on this item today. I'm, I'm sure you all have read the news yesterday, day before, over the weekend, um, and are aware of the reports of the 75 currently employed officers that we have within our department estimated that engaged in disgusting, racist, Islamophobic, homophobic, uh, discriminatory uh, language and presentations on their social media. Um, I think it is indicative of a culture, a negative culture within our police department. And I wanted to come down today with the remaining seconds that I have and urge you very strongly to one, publish the Brady List publicly on the city's website so that all of our citizens can see which officers have engaged in conduct that has resulted in violating policies and procedures and or people's civil rights. Uh, and two, uh, be as transparent as you possibly can in disciplining officers. Uh, the death of Mr. Mbebu uh, is not unlike the death of Michelle Cousseau, not unlike the paralyzing of Edward Brown, not unlike the traumatizing of Edgar Castro, and so on and so forth. You know the names and the cases. Uh, this is just another example. I think, what's the settlement? $200,000, you know, 700 and some odd thousand for Michelle Cousseau, $100,000 for Edgar Castro. Who knows what you'll pay for Ed Brown? We really have to get to the bottom of this. And uh, as I close, uh, I hope that one way we can do it um, is to employ more officers of color, Latino and African American. I think if that was the case, and I'm gonna finish quickly, that we would see less of this. I think because we have such a uh, disparity and a lack of diversity on our police force, uh, that there are officers that feel they can get away with this. You certainly wouldn't do it uh, if they knew they had colleagues of color or supervisors, honestly, that they had to, uh, to deal with. I hope the city and Thelda might be able to remember, Sal might remember, Michael, please, I'm sure. Please wrap up your comments. Please. Yes, we'll remember when we had a program like uh, Romp that was intentional in recruiting uh, people of color to serve in these positions to try to eliminate some of this. Thank you. Thank you. Council member comments? Councilman DeCicio. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, to Reverend Moppin, uh, you and I have been friends for quite a few years, and one of the things I think that we do agree on that there needs to be a higher level of diversity. Uh, you have to be representative of the population that you serve. Without a doubt, I believe that. I'm not big on quotas, as you would guess, but at the same time, I think that there's nothing wrong with, and I think we need to be striving for a model where we do push for a better uh, level of diversity in our city. Um, I don't think it's right to, and this is where we'll disagree, if that's all right with you, uh, I don't think it's fair or right to disparage or even to assume that the entire police department feels a certain way, because they don't. These individuals work hard, they go to work, yeah, they don't know if they're gonna come back that day. These individuals, you know, some individuals, I, I think it's down to maybe 10 uh, individuals that were posting a majority of these Facebook posts a lot of that, you know, I looked at most of that stuff, and a lot of it looked like political speech, which they're allowed to criticize us, criticize others. 
it's when they cross the line, and I believe that our investigations are going to be looking into that, and that's what the police chief's going to do, and I feel strongly that she will. But at the same time, we have a lot of men and women that work really hard in our department. They do everything. They go to work. They do all the right things. And if you look at what's happening in our world today, and I've had this conversation with my kids just, just this morning, literally this morning, about Facebook and social media. So for those of you that are out there in the social media world, which I am, but you got to look at what ends up happening, whatever you write today, you're being judged on one comment over multiple years, over thousands of comments you may have out there. One comment is the one that's going to come out and the people are going to look at it. It's going to look at like occurred today, when in fact a lot of those things happened 10 years ago, seven years ago. So at the end of the day, uh, I think people are still struggling with this whole social media thing, but at the same time, our police officers do an amazing job. They're incredible. They've done everything right. They go to work, they've got families, they do everything they can to protect their families and to make sure that they've done all the right things to, to raise their children right, or, or to basically rear their children right, I guess is the right word. But, it, but I'm really concerned about these attacks on them, on these constant battering of these individuals. I really am concerned about that. And matter of fact, I don't know how they do their jobs. I really don't. There are fewer police officers today handling more people, more things. One of the things that we can do is have two police officer cars. I really believe you're going to see less anxiety and less stress out in the public if we had two police officer cars because you've got two people diffusing a situation. Uh, so at the end of the day, it'd be a lot better if we um, like this group that's out of Philadelphia, I really believe that they're out there, just a group of attorneys, they're looking to sue because they're coming out with all this. But if you look at some of the quotes that they had out there, they were just, they were political speech, criticizing us, criticizing even the president, putting a wig on the president. I mean, so what? They're allowed to do those things as long as they don't bring disre uh, 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 disrepute to the department. And there was a couple of those that were out there that I would find problematic. Attacking Islam, I think, is a problem. I don't think you do those things. Uh, but again, a lot of this stuff, people have a right to say what they want to say as long as it doesn't bring harm to the department. And I think the majority of those police officers did nothing wrong. They didn't do anything wrong. Well, if, if ahead, I you, may, you, yeah. if I may, uh, if that's okay. No, we, we oh. need to continue. I'd like well, to, I thought I, I could I respond if this yeah, direct. You, we've known each other for a lot of years. Sure. And so. Uh, you know, I think that the facts are a little bit different than you, you know, than your set of alternative facts when it comes to the police. Uh, case in point, the police report for uh, Jacob Harris, the son of Roland Harris, who was shot in the back on the city's west side. The notice of claim is due, the lawsuit's due, the police department hasn't turned in the report. It's been more than six months. The attorney, former Attorney General Tom Horn, is suing with a special action to force the department to release the report. Why? because we know that the report is going to uh, make the city look foolish in terms of the narrative or their version of events with respect to that case. Also within our department, there's no, it's not coincidental that we have these social media posts and that we have these images out there and we have the highest number of fatalities in the larger, the top 10 American cities. I mean, what are we doing having more fatalities and negative encounters with police than Chicago or Philadelphia or New York or New Orleans or Los Angeles? This is Phoenix, Arizona. There's something, there's something wrong. And I, I agree with you. We do need right, two-man two patrols. I'm just about done, Madam Mayor. We do need two-man patrols. Um, but what we don't need is to continue to hire the refuse of law enforcement agencies all over the country. And that's what we've been doing. We've been hiring, quite frankly, uh, inept officers that have been drummed out of their home jurisdictions and they find a home here in Arizona where you can uh, get away with being, frankly, a racist police officer and there's not All much right, you can done. do about it. You're done. Oh, uh, thank you. Oh, thank we appreciate you. your testimony. No, thank you for employing these people. We have a strong police department. We can always do better. We are committed to continuous improvement. There were social media posts that were not acceptable. The chief is taking decisive action. As mayor, I am committed to a city that polices everyone and takes care of everyone, regardless of your race, your religion, your political beliefs. We are moving forward with this, but it's not necessary to make these statements to try to get on television. We have an active plan with nine points to address officer-involved shootings. Any final comments? Councilman. 
Mayor, I'd be open as the chair of the public safety to sit down and, and any type of recruitment programs that are out there, we're open to any ideas. So I'd sit down with Reverend Moffitt to discuss those. When we appreciate that you regularly put on your council, you chair our sub subcommittee on public safety and regularly ask for and provide tools to our department to recruit a police force that looks like our city. So I think we need to be clear, this is something you and this council has been working on. Roll call. Decisia? What are we voting on again? No, I'm just kidding, just kidding. I had to lighten it up a little bit. Yes. You really have to poke, don't Ivar? you? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Item 35 is a payment to the Trump administration for landfill oversight. Move to approve item 35. Second. Roll call. DeCicio? No. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Uh, yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Item passes eight to one. Move to approve item 41. Second. Leonard Clark has a card. Mr. Clark, you have two minutes. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Leonard Clark, born right down the street at Good Samaritan Hospital, lifelong resident of beautiful Phoenix and beautiful District 1. Uh, I'm glad you're uh, doing these permits. Uh, in these times, reports have been coming out from around Luke Air Force Base and other communities where water has gotten contaminated and worries about things leaking into water tables. I want to make sure that the citizens of Phoenix can be totally uh, feeling safe when they know that the water that they and their loved ones are drinking is not contaminated with toxins. So uh, thank you so much, and I, I do agree with this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Roll call. Decisio? Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Item passes unanimously. We next move to our budget-related items. Item 46 is a public hearing on the 2016 to 2024 Capital Improvement Program. I will now open the public hearing. City Clerk, are there any cards? There are no cards on this item. The public hearing is closed. Item 47 is the adoption of the 2019 to 2024 Capital Improvement Program. Councilwoman Williams, do you have a motion? On item 47, correct. I move the adoption of the 2019-2024 Capital Improvement Program. Second. That's resolution 21753. Any council member comments? The clerk will call the roll. DeCicio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Good job, Jeff. Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? No. Gallego? Yes. The item passes eight to one. Item 48 is a public hearing on the adoption of the tentative 2019 through 2020 annual budget ordinances. I will now declare the public hearing open. Are there any cards? We will now close the public hearing. Item 49 is the adoption of the tentative 2019 through 2020 annual budget. This is, we've had a, a series of hearings on this and this is not our first vote, but we continue to have these votes in compliance with state law. Uh, Councilman Williams, do we have a motion? I move the item 49 being ordinance S45682, the tentative 2019-2020 annual budget be adopted. Second. Will the city clerk please call the roll? DeCicio? Uh, Mayor, just a quick comment though to, again, you've heard me say this before, it's not from the city manager or the, you know, or Jeff, because you guys have done an amazing job this year on the budget, you really have. Uh, my vote against this is because I believe it's a structural deficit that we have within the city of Phoenix and we've just not addressed that. And so I continue to vote against these until I believe that the structural deficit's been fixed. Thank you, Mayor, so I'm a no. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? No. Gallego? Yes. 
Item passes seven to two. Item 50 is the adoption of the tentative 2019 through 2020 capital funds budget. Mayor, I move that item 50 being ordinance S45751, the tentative 2019-20 capital funds budget be adopted. Second. We have a motion and a second. City Clerk, will you please call the roll? DeCicio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pestle? Yes. Stark? Williams? Yes. Waring? No. Gallego? Yes. Passes eight to one. Item 51 is the adoption of the 2019 to 2020 reapportioned funds budget. We have two cards on this item, but before we hear those cards, uh, Councilman Williams, do you have a motion? I move that item 51 being the ordinance S45683, the tentative 2019-2020 reapportioned Fund budget be adopted. Second. We have a motion and a second. And um, could our city budget dire and research director just briefly explain what this item does? Sure, Mayor, members of the, of the council, the reappropriated funds budget allows us to take funding that was budgeted in the current fiscal year, 1819, that expires June 30th of this, of this calendar year, and allows us to pay bills where we've encumbered contracts where all of those bills have not yet been rendered to the city. So it allows us to carry the funding forward so we can continue to pay those bills. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Jerry Kettlehut is our first card. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good afternoon, Council Members. You know, I'm not so sure hearing what this, what this is about that we're in the right category. We went around and around on what it is, but really this is a shout out uh, to Councilman Mendoza for really uh, hearing her community in Levine for adaptive recreation. I'm uh, Jerry Cattlehead, the Director of Daring Adventures, and we are the City of Phoenix's adaptive recreation partner, and we're so excited to be working with the community uh, this summer t uh, with adaptive recreation. A huge shout out also to the community members, Michelle, and to Raul, uh, who I've been working with dearly, as well as uh, Parks and Rec to make this happen. So we are so excited. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I think on a similar topic, uh, Raul Daniels. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I'm, glad, I'm, I'm surprised you could read my writing. I was sitting there looking at that thing. Man, I wish you could read my, my writing. It's anyway, Ethan wanna... Levine, so we just need to leave you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I want to take this opportunity to thank both Councilman Nalkowski and Councilman Mendoza um, on really aggressively looking into providing some service for our kids out there. I know we have a summer program that starts next month. We're really hoping you continue to work on getting us something for the fall, even if it's just one day a week. And we're really looking forward to hopefully getting that therapeutic rec coordinator on board as soon as possible as well. Thank you very much. We've got a banner from the kids, special needs kids out in Levine, but they wouldn't let me bring it in here. So it's waiting out front for you. Don't forget to take it with you, all right? The kids work real hard on that. You'll see a little a picture of Wonder Woman. That's you on that thing. <laughs> Thank you very much once again. High pressure when you have Wonder Woman up here. I feel like this vote's gonna go well. <laughs> All right, we already have a motion and a second, so I'll ask the city clerk to call the roll. DeCicio? Yes. Guevara? Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes unanimously. <laughs> Woohoo, Wary. <laughs> I think it was this Wonder Woman that got him home. <laughs> We next move to item 53, the designation of voting centers for our August 2019 special election related to transit and a spending limit for the city. Leonard Clark has a card. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I just want to let you know as a citizen of Phoenix and District 1 in the City of Phoenix, I strongly support this and thank you. Uh, I, as many of my friends in the City of Phoenix, are concerned that uh, sometimes uh, our voting, we have a hard time voting, but the City of Phoenix and Adrian Fontes and Maricopa County elections are helping to make it easier, and especially uh, in light of the governor just slashing the budget for the 2020 presidential elections next year. I hope you'll continue to work with Adrian Fontes and make sure that as many citizens that can legally and constitutionally vote in the City of Phoenix are allowed to do so in light of the voter suppression going on and the radical slashing at the state legislature by the governor. Thank you. 
Thank you. Roll call. Oh, we do. I'm sorry, we do not have a motion yet. Uh, Mayor, I would move item 53, the salary part of 55 and 73. Pardon me? Fifty-three, fifty-five, the salary part, and seventy-three. Second. Second. Fifty-three, fifty-five. Just to clarify, 70. what was the last one? Seventy-three. Seventy-three. Okay. Do we have any additional cards on any of those items? Wonderful. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Decisio. Yes. Guevara. Yes. Mendoza. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. I understand we're voting on 53 and now we're voting on 73? 53, I, uh, 55, yeah, the, and 73. three items combined. Okay, <clears throat> so I have questions. So is this the time for discussion? Shall we remove item 73 then? I, just, I have a question for staff. I'm 73. Oh. Okay. Would you, uh, Councilman, would you entertain a friendly motion, uh, <clears throat> amendment to your motion to remove 73? Yeah. So we will now vote, continue our vote on 53 and 55, the salary portion. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. So it passes eight to one. Uh, now we move to item 54, which is creating code related to scrap metal dealers. Uh, city, uh, will our city clerk please read the title? Item 54 is for ordinance G6599, an ordinance amending chapter 19, article one, section 19-1, subsection 27 of the Phoenix City Code relating to the regulation of scrap metal dealers to conform the Phoenix City Code to an amendment of state law relating to scrap metal dealers. Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. This was one that Councilman Nowakowski's subcommittee has been working on so long. I was on it the last time when this <laughs> began. We finally. And a great opportunity for us to make sure we reward people who are doing recycling right and cut down on fraud. Uh, we have someone who's been working with us all that time, Brittany Bingold, here for testimony. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, for the record, my name is Brittany Bingold with Pivotal Policy Consulting, here today on behalf of the Arizona Scrap Recyclers Association. As the Mayor mentioned, we've been working on this for quite a while, so I'll keep my comments brief. We just wanted to thank you for your support in the hard, dedicated uh, work that the staff, city staff, um, and the subcommittee members, as well as uh, Mayor Gallego, you guys have put into this. This is uh, very important to our association. It not only takes the city uh, in line with state statute. It also is incredibly important to our, our local business community and extricating Phoenix from this uh, fraudulent activity taking place in our, our neighbor state. So I'm available for any questions, but thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments from council members? Roll call. Decisio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes eight to one. We next move to item 55, the reappointment of our municipal court judge and chief presiding judge. I would move approval. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Decisio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Congratulations to our judges on that strong vote of confidence from our city council. We'll look forward to seeing them at a future meeting to be recognized. We next move to item 73, the towing services contract. I would move approval. We have a motion and a second. Councilwoman Pastor. I have some questions for staff. Thank you. 
So in 2018, March 2018, um, I was traveling abroad in China and we happened to have a council meeting while I was gone. And during that time, it was regarding this RFP, um, the general uh, police towing RFP 17-182. And for whatever reason, uh, I don't know what happened, but I came back and the next immediate meeting there was a um, vote on reconsideration of RFP 70-182. And the R, uh, reconsideration uh, then failed at that time. And at that time, staff was asked to draft a new RFP um, and get it out or to start the process to draft a new RFP. Then February uh, 2019, we got a contract and said, uh, we're gonna extend it to December 31st, 2019. So my question to staff is, why have we not done a new RFP? Or have, I don't think this is a new R RFP, I think this is an extension. So uh, my question to staff is, when are we planning on doing the RFP? And the extension is for seven years, and I believe we probably could do an extension less than that and get an RFP out in the, out in the community. Councilwoman Pastor, um, you are correct. There was a procurement process that was done. It was protested and appealed. It went to an administrative law judge, and the council um, voted three to five, so it did not pass. Um, from there, we worked with the Public Safety Subcommittee and we proposed options. One of them was a procurement process, an extension, and the subcommittee voted four to zero to do a long-term extension because of um, the market has been tested a couple times in a, a procurement process, and these three companies are, appear to be the only ones capable of handling this size of a contract. Okay. okay. So what I'm hearing is that uh, because it, there's only three companies that can ha um, handle the size of our city, this is the option she, we went down, or this is the option we have chosen, or the committee chose. Yes, Mayor, City Council, um, Councilwoman Pastor, that is correct. And the other thing I'd like to add is, you know, these are very capital intensive um, processes, meaning the towing companies have to have a lot of fleet on staff, and that's one of the reasons why we chose to extend the period for seven years, because of the capital investment that the towing companies have to make to have service for the City of Phoenix. Additionally, they have to have lots leased within each zone. So there's four zones and they have to have land to store vehicles within each one of those loans. So they have to sign a long-term lease. Okay, so I understand or, or I understand why at this moment we're doing seven years, but I guess my question back is, then why didn't we do an RFP if, in, in 2018 if these were the only uh, groups that could serve uh, the city of Phoenix? The normal part of the process, Councilwoman Pastor, is to conduct a competitive procurement process, which we did. Um, we went through the entire evaluation, and as mentioned, it was protested and appealed. Um, okay, I, well, the reason why is I'm, I'm asking why are the rules changing now? <laughs> why did it shift? The mayor, city council, if I could just add, I think we used that process to determine the fact that we had three qualified vendors to do the size of our city to offer that service. So we use the information that we gathered from that procurement process to make this, ju this judgment. Okay, thank you. Thank you, any council member questions or comments? Roll call. Decisio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes eight to one. We move to item 76, legal counsel services. I would move uh, approval of 76. We have a motion, do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any council member comments? Legal 76? 76. Roll call. Tasicio? I'm gonna be voting no on this, Mayor. Thank you. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? 
Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Oh, no, no, excuse me, no. Gallego? Yes. It almost passed eight to one, but it <laughs> passed seven to two. I didn't want you to get too comfortable with that eight to one <laughs> voting scheme. It was, it was getting to be a very exciting council meeting. We now move to item 82 to amend the animal ordinance and city code regarding the feeding of pigeons. Uh, would uh, the city clerk please read the title? Item 82 is for ordinance G6598, an ordinance amending chapter 8, article 2 of the Phoenix City Code by adding a new subsection 8-7.02 pertaining to the prohibition of feeding pigeons. Mayor, I would move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. We have cards from citizens here to peek on, speak on this item. Uh, Gail Kimson will be followed by Leonard Clark. Good afternoon. My name is Gail Kimson, and I have totally approved of this ordinance. Thank you. Um, the ordinance says that it is unlawful for any person to feed pigeons within the city. I represent a neighborhood that has a beautiful park with approximately 2,000 pigeons on a daily basis. And so what I would love to see is if the verbiage here could include the parks. And also, if so, have appropriate signage so that people would understand that it is unlawful to do so. Thank you very much. Mayor, I believe that there's been conversations with the park department about this, and I think it's covered. But I agree with your signage. I think that we should post that particular park um, because of the mess created by these pigeons, uh, that no pigeon feeding. Wonderful, thank you. Do we need, uh, move forward? Okay, uh, we'll take, do we need any further clarification from staff? All right, then we will, uh, next to the podium is Leonard Clark. My name is Leonard Clark, thank you. Somebody's gotta be Clarence Darrow for the pigeons. The okay, look, I have plenty of friends who hate pigeons. They call them vermin, trash, you know, fecal matter, all that. I'm just a little concerned, you know, um, because I'm not sure, and I, this is my fault. Are you going to charge people, in addition to being civilly charged, are you going to be able to charge them criminally? I mean, is this going to give new language to the term jailbird? Because when I'm in jail, because someone reports me and says, what are you in here for, bank robbery, mugging? No, I'm in here because I was feeding pigeons. That makes me a jailbird, but maybe not a stool pigeon. I don't know. Anyways, so um, I did put neutral on this. I understand the very nice people out there. My own friends are like, do not even defend the pigeons. But I'm just concerned about that criminal part. Uh, they, uh, you know, but if you do check the writing as far as spreading disease, they don't carry from what I understand the, uh, the uh, bird flu and all these other things. But on the other hand, they do have problems. So it just seems like, man, am I gonna be a criminal now because I got caught you know, at Lazy Lou's Fish and Chips throwing out some bread. So what is this world coming to? I'm here to defend the pigeons, so thank you. Certainly winning the pun of the council meeting. So it's my understanding it is a class one misdemeanor and so we are not, the jailbird is, well, should we, um, could we get a brief testimony? about jailbirds. Welcome our neighborhood services director. Thank you, Mayor, City Council. Uh, this does prohibit uh, feeding of pigeons throughout the city of Phoenix. It does allow up to a class one uh, misdemeanor. Um, which carries with it a fine. However, it allows the city prosecutor the discretion as to whether to charge it civilly or criminally, which is in line with the rest of Chapter 8 as well as Chapter 39, Chapter 41, the other codes that the Neighborhood Services Department enforces. Wonderful, thank you. 
Councilwoman Guevara. Yes, I'd just like to make a, a comment or some comments, if I may. I understand that we've had some issues in neighborhoods with regard to uh, people feeding pigeons, but I don't think that this ordinance is the best way to address it for two reasons. First, feeding pigeons shouldn't be a class one misdemeanor. Far too often when a problem comes up, uh, reflexively, we reflexively turn to the criminal code, but not all behavior that we don't like should be criminalized. If you all look at Phoenix City Code, um, a person who intentionally poisoned and killed a pet would be guilty of a class one misdemeanor, just like a person feeding pigeons under this ordinance would be. Second, I think the ordinance is written too broadly. As I understand it, there have been some issues with people feeding pigeons on private property and it having negative effects on nearby properties, but this ordinance doesn't address only that issue. Under this ordinance, if I'm feeding the ducks at Desert West Park and happen to also feed a pigeon, I have just committed a crime. I believe this ordinance should contain only, only civil penalties and should be narrowly tailored to address the conduct we'd like to prevent, and um, I'm gonna be voting no on this. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And maybe if there, our- There's a lady, and I, I don't know what your name is. Could you bring the pictures up and pass them down? And the next two cards are from Sherry Marinick and I think Kathy Busby? So, okay. Please. You have two minutes, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, we moved into our neighborhood in April of 2018 and immediately figured out that there was a horrible pigeon problem. There's one person feeding the birds in large bags of feed at his house and at the neighborhood park. This happens at least daily at each location that I see. According to the neighborhood website and neighbor accounts, he's been asked many times to stop, but reportedly becomes aggressive. We have contacted many agencies and the city of Phoenix with the hopes of being helped with this situation. We found nothing could be done legally. Our yards, homes, <clears throat> including AC units, Pools and vehicles are being covered with and ruined by bird feces and feathers. Our grandchildren can't play outside without standing in bird feces, seeing dead birds, eggs, maggots, and having their toys covered with poop and feathers. This can't be healthy. There's also the issue of wasted water to continually clean this mess. Um, and he does clean his yard every day with a pressure washer. Please help us to have a course of action by passing this ordinance. And could. Could you state your name for the record? Thank you, Sherry Marinick. Wonderful. And I'm not sure if I heard the first name correctly, but Busby. Oh, Keith, Keith, I see, thank you. Hi, thank you very much. I just uh, wanna just emphasize, take a look at those pictures. It is, uh, it is imperative to get our lives back. It is, uh, everything that we own is getting destroyed. I am in the direct fly zone from where this man feeds his pigeons in my backyard, which is his backyard, which oversees my kitchen. Looking, those pictures are from my kitchen window every day that he feeds from there seven or eight times every day. Then he feeds in the park, which is a direct fly zone over my house. Everything I've owned for the last seven years has been pasted on a daily basis. It's, it's disgusting and we've fought and begged for seven years for this day to come. Please pass this. Thank you. Mayor, may I ask him a question? Councilman, yes. Uh, have you thought about taking a civil uh, route on this, taking it to court? And, you know, destruction uh, Keith, of property. Oh, sorry. Uh, do we, I think Councilman DeCicio Keith was hoping to ask you a question. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, go ahead. Have you thought about taking him to court and filing a lawsuit against him for destruction of your property because his actions are a direct relationship to what's happening on your property? That's next. We need the law to pass first. That's next. But why would you need a law? I mean, if someone comes in and basically, I'm just asking, I'm just, don't get mad no, at no, me. No, no, okay? no, 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 I've got no, everybody no. else mad at me about everything else. But uh, so from, you, I'm just asking these questions because I'm just curious as to what kind of path it would seem to me that if someone's creating a, an attractive nuisance or a problem on someone and impacting someone else's property, that is something you could go to court on whether there's an ordinance or not. 
N no, there's, there's nothing we've been told that he is doing illegal right now. There's no law that he's breaking other than destroying our property that he does not have them in captivity. He doesn't have them in cages. He is just feeding them. So they're not legitimately his birds. Mm -hmm. So as of right now, they're just birds flying over our properties and destroying it until this passes, then we can move forward. Then we could start prosecuting or do any other types of lawsuits for the damage. But for right now, we can do nothing, nothing, nothing. So you consulted an attorney. I'm not talking about the criminal side. I'm talking about the civil side of it. Because if someone is creating a situation where your property is being impacted by that, you have a right to take it to court. I, I, what I'm trying to get at is I'm trying to figure out what you've done so far. If you've gone to an attorney and filed a lawsuit against the individual personally, not on the criminal side, but on the civil side. We are waiting for this to pass. But why do you need this to do that? Because he's not broken a law. From what we're told, it, there's no it's difference. It's not about the law. It's about the destruction of your property and creating an attractive nuisance and creating a situation where your home is no longer bearable. There are there are, civil re there are civil recourses you can do this on your own by going to an attorney and filing a lawsuit against him individually. I'm just wondering why that didn't happen. Without the criminal side, I get that side. We were waiting because we were told by the Maricopa County and the City of Phoenix and Game and Fish Department that he's not doing anything wrong. Agreed. All three departments but, have shot us down. Okay. Well, I think there's a disconnect in our conversation. I know what you're. I, I know what you're saying. No, I've not yeah. got a lawyer and and filed any complaints yet. I okay. was hoping that I had some type of recourse to back that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nick Punak, do you wish to testify? We have seven cards from individuals who are here in support of this ordinance, not wishing to speak. Councilwoman Williams. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we've been working on this for quite a while for months, uh, and I think the way it's written is very fair to the neighborhood. It, one person can't just turn in another person. It takes uh, three members of the community that live nearby, adjacent, to file this. Uh, neighborhood services will do the inspection like they do any inspection, but no one should have to live in those conditions. Um, the amount of number of birds and the amount that they leave behind is tremendous and I would be very upset if my grandkids couldn't play in the backyard or the front yard or my car had a different covering than what it came with. I mean there's a, so much to the downsize but it doesn't mean that you can't still or still feed birds. You can. This is the, for people who are very negligent about how much they feed and how it impacts their neighborhood. And I think it's a fair way to treat this. It gives those who are being abused a methodology to pursue. It will be handled as if any other uh, call, a complaint comes in the neighborhood services. It has to go through that entire process. So I'm very supportive of this. Vice Mayor Wing, Waring. I guess a question for Spencer uh, or Mario, I'm not sure. So, so if I'm not wrong, neighborhood services, if you get a call about uh, a pool that hasn't been chlorinated and it's filled with you know, green algae and mosquitoes and so forth, the city can take that person to court, right? Yes, uh, any violation of our chapter 39, um, sections of 41 and sections of chapter eight, the neighborhood services department can enforce on. We start with education, of course. We, we don't go straight to enforcement. Right, I understand, yeah. yeah. But, the, there, but there are steps that, steps why on. would, kind of to Councilman DeCicio's point, why would this be different than that? I mean, what's, why couldn't you use the same section on this? Currently, under the city code, we could address issues where there is a significant accumulation of bird waste, let's say. Um, however, the actual feeding of birds is not currently prohibited under the city code. But so, uh, Madam Mayor, so I assume that there's a lot of bird waste at the person who's feeding. I mean, I assume the birds would eat and then go to the bathroom at least in the same general area. One, one of the I mean, all the mosquitoes wouldn't be concentrated in that person's backyard. They'd spread out, so. 
Right, and one of the interesting things that we've found uh, when we've been researching pigeons for this item, um, pigeons don't typically roost where they feed, and so uh, they may feed at the offender's property, um, but then they roost on the neighbor's property, and, and waste does kind of expand from there and other issues that come along with pigeons. All right. See, I wouldn't have necessarily guessed all that, so <laughs> this is very informative, Spencer. I really enjoy these talks. Let me tell you, this is fantastic. Um, okay, so that's the difference. That's why we can't, because there isn't waste at the person's house who's feeding it. Not necessarily, correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mayor? Councilman. I'll be really quick. Um, it, normally, this is not what you know, I'd always want to make sure people took their steps and they did all those things. But the fact that Councilwoman Williams is supporting this motion, I'm going to be supporting her on this. She's worked on it for multiple years. I'm going to rely on your judgment on that. Um, but the, the fact of the matter with pigeons, they are a problem. You can never, ever, ever let them roost in your home. Never. Because once they do, they will stay there forever. And there's a reason why back in the Middle Ages they were used is because they always go home and they will come there forever, year after year after year. It's, it sounds like an odd thing, but it is true. So I'm going to rely on the fact that I do trust her judgment. But normally it's not something I would support because I would always want to see you take those additional steps and I don't think you've gone that far yet. But that, that's just on my position. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And for Spencer, we would begin with education in this process. Absolutely. Currently, um, with the uh, chapters that the Neighborhood Services Department enforces, we achieve a 94% voluntary compliance rate. We would expect the same under this ordinance, uh, and that would be in line with what the City of Tempe has, uh, has seen with their similar ordinance. And so it would be incredibly rare. I mean, we, we began this conversation with the jailbirds. Right. Uh, I, I would not anticipate any jail time for any offenders. Uh, even under the Class 1 misdemeanor, it starts with a, uh, a, f a fine of $150. Perfect. And the prosecutors, our goal here is not to get the revenue, right. it is not to punish people, it is to get safe, healthy neighborhoods. Okay. Any a question? Uh, Just a question. Yes. Is, so is only NSD enforcing this ordinance? Um, Mayor, uh, Councilwoman Guevara. Uh, no, so the section that's related to private property is enforced by the Neighborhood Services Department. Um, if there was feeding of pigeons in city parks, the Parks Department uh, would be responsible for enforcing that. Um, the alleys, potentially public works, uh, there are different departments that would, would enforce. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Waring. Since you seem to know a lot about these pigeons, I'm curious how long does it take them to realize there's no more? So you go out and knock, the person doesn't want to get in trouble, they're one of the 94% who comply completely. What then? How long do the pigeons, how long does it take the pigeons to realize, I mean, when is this problem solved? Is it years? I mean, it, you know, the pigeons tend to go home, so do they mm -hmm. continue to come back thinking there's going to be food? Even Mayor, there isn't any? Councilman Waring. Um, that is a great question, and I think it depends also on the, t the resources that homeowners use. Um, so, for instance, if the feeding just stops and there's no additional um, uh, tools that are used, uh, it could potentially be a, uh, quite some time. But I know that for a lot of the folks who came out and discussed their particular situations with us at the hearings by phone or through email, they shared that they routinely use you know, different tools, the, the fake owls, the different sounds, the ultrasonic. They, they try different ways to prevent pigeons from roosting. And I think with those tools, it could be a much quicker um, positive result. Unfortunately, I don't have a great answer for that. I sense I've tested your boundary of pigeon knowledge. I'm sorry. Um, maybe there's a special school you can go to to learn more. I don't know. Uh, it's probably get some credit from Ed to do that. Um, so, so um, but, but the jailbird comment. So you talked about the 94%, but, but we've talked about this before. So that the progression is if they don't comply, you take them to court, and then it goes on and on and on. Is, jail an actual possibility for someone who just, I'm not saying they're right to do it, but is that a possibility at some point? I'll ask Bob Smith uh, with the city prosecutor's office to help with that answer. Um, Mayor Geigo, Councilman, Councilman Waring, yes, theoretically it is a possibility. It's a class one misdemeanor, but as what's been asked and addressed, it would be progressive. It's 
really no different than the Neighborhood Preservation Ordinance Chapter 39 that Spencer mentioned, that the focus is to educate, to get people in compliance. Neighborhood services routinely starts with civil notices of violations first, then a civil citation. This here would allow the civil as well. It's not anyone's intent to go right to a criminal charge. But to honestly answer your question, since it is a class one misdemeanor, somebody could theoretically go to jail, but that would likely be a situation that is going on for years and the city's gone through the education process. Neighborhood services has talked to the owner and we're gonna have to prove that they're feeding them. That's the bottom line, what kind of what Spencer is talking about is that if the feeding stops and eventually the pigeons go away, and I'm, I'm not an expert either on how long that would take, but there's gonna have to be under this ordinance evidence that the person's actually feeding for them to even go to get a civil fine or go further in the enforcement process. We have to prove that. Oh, Madam Mayor, you, you anticipated my next question, so we'd have to prove it, so how would we do that? Now the neighbors might say we could take video, but I thought we had issues with people shooting videos into their neighbor's yard, or, I mean, using video in their neighbor's yard. I mean, how, how are we supposed to find this out? That, it's that they're being, if they're doing it in their backyard, it's, it's fenced in. How do you know that they're being fed? It's gonna have to be through investigation of if you see them putting food out, things of that nature. It's not meant to go after people that are feeding hummingbirds, things of that nature. It's directly people that are feeding pigeons. But you're right, there can be challenges if it's secluded in somebody's backyard behind trees and you because even if you had a camera what if there's trees you can't see it so it's going to have to be proven okay thank you thank you any further when i guess for the folks who've been involved with this if we just took jail off the table as a potential outcome do we believe this could still be effective i'm a little concerned some people who do not appreciate their neighbor's advice. They don't want to be a good neighbor. And I have a couple of cases that Neighborhood Services has been working on for many years. And even when, if you took this before a judge, I don't believe a judge would immediately put somebody in jail. I think they'd fine them $150, and it's a progressive process. But I, there are certain people that you need to have something out there that's $150 doesn't mean much anymore. And, but jail time, yeah. And I think it's a weapon that we need to have in our back pocket, use seldom, but have it available to let people know it's serious about it. Okay, any further questions, comments? Roll call. Decisio? Yes. Guevara? No. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Gallego? Yes. Lover? Seven to two. Item 80, next up is item 84 related to the convention center. Leonard Clark. Mayor and council member, my name is Leonard Clark. Thank you, and I promise not to fight any subpoenas on birds in the future. Uh, I'm strongly backing you're trying to find the best disposition of this Phoenix Convention Center. I think we've been doing a, a better job than a lot of people give you credit for. It's beautiful down there. I can remember as a kid going down and this whole area being really run down. So, you know, we're attracting great things. I just hope you can get the best price, and I welcome Homeland Security that's coming to our convention center this next week. Thank you. Steve Cohn. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Steve Cohn. I'm the uh, majority beneficial owner of the Renaissance Hotel downtown, for those that don't know me. Uh, I've been around downtown for quite a while. I, I started managing that hotel in 1993. Uh, during the 90s, it really wasn't such a good time to have a hotel in downtown Phoenix. We lost a lot of money. Uh, people came downtown to, to go to Suns games, but not, not really a great deal else. Uh, when we, we got kind of up and approaching 2000, uh, there was talk about 
maybe expanding the convention center. I was asked to serve on the expansion, uh, convention center uh, expansion committee by uh, then city manager Frank, Frank Fairbanks. I also, uh, from the financial side, uh, was asked by Governor uh, Napolitano to sit on that strategic task force. And through all of that, we came up with the plans to expand the convention center. Uh, and that happened. And since then, things have been going really pretty good. It had the misfortune of opening at a pretty bad time. Uh, we had a recession, and we had the impact of SB 1070, which was a really terrible, terrible thing for convention business in downtown Phoenix. But the convention center has been a really, really significant engine driving business in downtown Phoenix, and is one of the things responsible for making downtown Phoenix a, a really good place to be. So, you know, I encourage what you are looking to do, seeking community involvement, I think is a great thing. Uh, I have one concern, which I'll, I'll get on the table, which is when you get community involvement, you get opinions. And you'll have a lot of people that think a lot of things, and you can agree with them or not agree with them. And th that's all good. You guys have made some really good decisions so far. I'm pretty happy with what council has done, what city staff has done. If I look at, you know, our hotel from before convention center to after convention center, uh, our revenue has doubled. Uh, from, if I just look, 2013 profit compared to 2018 profit, it's four times. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy. So I'm, I'm happy with the council, I'm happy with the city, I'm, I'm a happy person, I'm happy with everybody. Uh, how, however, I, I do think do it's a, important. A final I'll wrap it up. I think it's important uh, to look at this from an economic standpoint. It's not just what do people think, but it's what does it mean? And that means some sort of market study uh, connected with it so that you guys have the data from which to make a reasoned decision. So my recommendation is that you don't use the time and then get to the end and then somebody say, let's do a market study. But you got the summer concurrently commission the market study, get the information you need to make reasoned decisions, and make reasoned decisions. So thank you, and that's what I think. Thank you. Councilman Nowakowski. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, I just want to thank you for your, all your participation in the um, Adam Street's um, activation. I mean, it's beautiful. The remodeling, the retail, the restaurants, it's very easily accessed, and it was the process that we brought the community and all the stakeholders in, and it turned out to be something really great. And, and thank, thank you for your thank participation. Thank you, and I, I should mention that that was a result of a study that was commissioned by Councilman Nowakowski, or recommended by Councilman Nowakowski, so I appreciate it. I can tell you that when you did it, I went to the meetings, and in my opinion, it was a total waste of time because nobody was ever gonna spend the money to do it. And then it sat in my drawer for a couple of years, and it's like, you know, this is actually a good idea. And so we became the ones that did it. So I, I really appreciate it. And that sort of shows, you know, what such a study can generate. And, you know, I appreciate your input on it. And so thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your testimony. I certainly agree that it's important that we make data-driven decisions, that we understand what has delivered the success our convention center has today and what going forward would contribute to its success. Any additional council member questions or comments? I would like to ask Chris, Chris a question. Welcome our economic development director. Chris, in yesterday's uh, subcommittee, uh, we talked about the, the convention center. What we didn't speak about is we didn't speak about a market study. Um, my question to you is, do I add, or I would like to add uh, on the motion, a market study, or should we wait till we get uh, the community input and then do a market study? I don't know which, how to, please advise. Absolutely, thank you, Mayor, uh, members of the council, council and pastor. As we worked on our project yesterday, what uh, uh, 
Convention Center Director Chan and I took away was that you were interested in data. You were interested in being able to make an informed decision. So as we finished that meeting yesterday, John and I did speak about the fact that we would commence a market study okay. to come back in conjunction with the community input. Okay, that's what I just needed to know. Thank if you. If it needed to be part of the motion or not. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Roll call. Oh, we do not have a motion. I move item 84. Councilman Pastor makes a motion. Councilman Nowakowski has seconded it. Roll call. DeCicio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes unanimously. Next move to item 120 related to the annual agreement with Value Met Valley Metro Rail for light rail operating costs. I would move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. This is an exciting one, especially coming off of our opening of our new uh, station that had such strong support as the council to try to engage people of all abilities, including those who use Ability 360. So exciting time for light rail. Any council member questions, comments? Roll call. Decisio? No. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? No. Gallego? Yes. Passes seven to two. Item 152 related to Stop Talking Stick Resort Arena Renovation Owners Representative. Move approval. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any cards? And this one, we did receive a letter from the Environmental and Sustainability Commission asking that we make sure sustainability is a top priority in this design and as we move forward with the arena that we continue to be a leader in, in sustainability. And that's certainly something that we've considered as a council and that I think is important. Uh, as folks know, this was not a top priority of mine, but the council has moved forward with it. And I think we now then have the opportunity to make sure we do a good job and get the best possible benefits for the taxpayer that we invest in an innovative facility that is befitting of a, our city. So I will be supporting this item. Any council member comments or questions? Roll call. DeCicio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? No. Gallego? Yes. Passes eight to one. Item 157, critical infrastructure, security, locking systems, and parts. Wait, one, it says 157 on the screen. Or do we want 167? Yeah, I didn't pull 157. Excellent. Perfect. We have two cards on item 167 related to a final plat. A final plat of the Night Village. Uh, Darina Bustamante is marked in favor. Is Darina, okay. Is Darina still with us? Is Amara Bickerstaff here? They both support the item. Any council member comments or questions? Roll call. Oh, we, I'm we, sorry, we, we do not, we need a motion. Move to approve item 167. Second. We have a motion and a second. Now we will have a roll call. Decisio. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Item passes unanimously. We next move to item 174, which is in so council. Item 174. We have a okay. motion <laughs> and a second. This is an item in Councilwoman Pastor's district. Oh. Councilwoman. Yes. Um, Alan, can you? Or can you provide some feedback uh, regarding 174? Thank you, Madam Chair, Councilwoman Pastor. Item 174 is a rezoning request located approximately 76 feet south, the southwest corner of 24th Avenue and Avalon Drive. It is a request from R16 to R3A for a two acre site for multifamily residential development. This case was not appealed, uh, so it's not on for a public hearing today. However, uh, Councilwoman Pastor's office 
held a, a meeting between some of the neighbors and the applicant to address uh, some traffic issues uh, within the neighborhood there. And the applicant has provided a letter committing to uh, uh, provide for, up to four speed humps um, in that area and pay for those speed humps pursuant to the city's uh, speed hump policy that the street transportation department administers. So um, I wanted to thank uh, the applicant and the neighbors for coming together. Uh, there were a number of issues, not number, but several issues that were, uh, they weren't agreeing upon. <laughs> and uh, so in having the discussion with both, uh, we realized really what it was, uh, was uh, one element was the parking and where, uh, if, if residents had enough parking, um, but we discovered that they do. And then the other was the impact that uh, this project would have on the neighborhood and the speed. And uh, so the good thing was is that the applicant and the neighbors uh, spoke about speed humps and uh, made an agreement. Uh, my understanding is made an agreement uh, up to four speed humps uh, depending on the traffic study of when the project has been built. Mayor Council Pastor, I believe <laughs> that is correct, and I, I think the applicant uh, is here uh, to make that commitment on the record as well, um, should the council desire that. Are you willing to do that? <laughs> Mayor Geigel, members of the council, I'm Reese Anderson with the law firm of Pune Lake. What a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Uh, Councilman Pastor, you summarized that agreement accurately, and you have our commitment on the record. I appreciate all your work, and I appreciate the fact that uh, the neighborhood uh, also was uh, willing to come together and work on this project. I think it's, it will be a great project in the neighborhood, and uh, it's a space that has been uh, empty for many, many years, and it's, it's good to see it being built. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman, for your hard work on this issue. We ready for a roll call? Sure. Roll call. DeCicio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Warner? Warren? Yes. <laughs> Gallego? Yes. Passes unanimously. <laughs> Those speed humps are very okay. controversial. Oh, yes. <laughs> We next move to item 177, uh, interior suite with accessory cooking facilities, and we'll ask our planning director to remain and give us a brief staff report. Uh, thank you, Mayor, members of council. Uh, this is a text amendment to the zoning ordinance to allow accessory cooking facilities, uh, essentially an interior suite within single family uh, homes. I'm gonna introduce Ms. Trish Gomes, who is the zoning administrator and served as project manager for this text amendment, and she's gonna do a brief PowerPoint. Thank you, uh, Mayor, members of the council. So yes, TA-6-18 as a text amendment to address interior suite uh, with accessory cooking facilities. Um, the, the zoning ordinance currently allows uh, semi-private spaces. Apologize. Uh, with uh, sinks and dishwashers, refrigerators, uh, but does not allow an additional cooking facility. So the photo on the left-hand side shows what the, the zoning ordinance currently allows today. On the right-hand side is what this text amendment um, seeks to achieve, is to allow that second cooking facility inside um, under the same roof as a single-family detached dwelling unit. As a part of the text amendment, we're to establish a definition for accessory um, or interior suite with accessory cooking facilities to allow that second stove. In addition, we have applicability, which would allow this in subdivisions that are 15 acres or larger. Um, for new subdivisions that are subdivided after the effective date of the zoning ordinance, or of this ordinance, and for any subdivisions that were subdivided prior to the effective date that have less than 25% of the lots that are either built or have active building permits, so that we can capture those uh, subdivisions that were started during the downturn and are now making a comeback. As well as there are conditions for use um, that the Interior suite with accessory cooking facilities would be required to be under the same roof on permitted only one on a lot. 
um, have an internal doorway um, so that you can access the semi-private space to the uh, remainder of the dwelling and have no more than one parking space for a maximum of four parking spaces. Uh, the interior suite with accessory cooking facilities cannot exceed 30% of the total net area or 800 square feet. Uh, cannot be separately metered or have a private yard or driveway because the intent is to operate as one single family dwelling in it. Um, and to address any um, concerns with having the appearance of a duplex, the elevations are required uh, to minimize that second entry, um, to minimize that visibility from the street. And with that, we are asking that the council uh, recommend approval of TA-6-18 as approved by the Planning and Economic Development Subcommittee. Any questions or comments? Councilwoman Stark and then Vice Mayor Waring. I was gonna. We have to have a public hearing first. I'm sorry, I was jumping. Right. <laughs> So uh, for staff mayor, um, so this is reducing a restriction. That mayor and vice mayor Waring, that is correct. Can I ask, like how did this, what, what problem were we solving in the first place and now we're feeling like there's less of a problem? Was there some specific example somewhere so, that this was yeah. a needed change? <laughs> mayor and, uh, and vice mayor, uh, as, we as a society are aging. Uh, there has been increased uh, public demand for multi-generational living. And so the marketplace has responded uh, with the, the most common one is called a next-gen unit, and that's by Lennar Homes, but all the other major home builders have their version of that. And it basically allows like a grandmother suite that is interior to the house. So instead of the you know, the, the days in the past where there was a separate detached, you know, structure that maybe uh, was your mother-in-law unit uh, lived in. These are really homes within a home, and so it allows you to have a, one interior door that parsons the, the grandmother suite off uh, and allows that to kind of function on its own, have a little bit of privacy, but also be part of the larger family. And we don't currently uh, allow them to have a second stove because these are zoned single family. And so that's the, the physical piece of infrastructure, uh, furniture, if you will, that is, is controlled to ensure that you're not having multiple units on one single family parcel, because that becomes then a multifamily dwelling on one parcel. And so that's why the stove is important uh, and why we put together this text amendment to, to really craft some regulations to allow it to respond to the market's need for multi-generational living, but at the same time, ensure that we're, that the council's not getting neighborhood complaints from people who want to rent out a unit and have two units on one single family lot. That becomes incredibly difficult to enforce because the city cannot go into someone's single family home unless they're invited. And so if NSD as part of the zoning enforcement was to go up, what would end up happening is that owner would have to admit to doing it. If they didn't, the city would never be able to really prove a case. And even though there'd be lots of neighborhood complaints, so that's why we came up with this uh, way to, to define it in a larger fashion to address the, the bigger issue, but not make it an enforcement issue that a lot of our established neighborhoods are having to deal with when they already have uh, Airbnb and v VRBOs, uh, party houses, all those other things that you guys are hearing a number of complaints about. Uh, this is trying to strike that right balance. Uh, Mayor, Alan, one of your charms is that you can turn bureaucrat ease into simple, easy to understand English so adroitly. So I appreciate that. Um, it's not a criticism of the presentation, but that was a lot easier to understand as a why are we doing this than, than some of what I heard before. So thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Councilman DeCicio. Thanks. It, Alan, and I appreciate all the work that you do over there. It just seems like it's more of an expansion of the Airbnb model that's already out there. I mean, by, by able, I mean, whether we're looking for it or not, we've created a multifamily um, home. I mean, you just it has even because you have a demising wall there. It sounds like you're going to be able to do that with a door. That door is going to be able to shut no different than a hotel room when you have a demising wall there and you have a door that attaches to it. So with the only difference is having the stove. Who brought this forward? I mean, there had to have been somebody or some group that said, hey, we got to have this. And we do have a card from Taylor Earl, so I could open the public hearing 
maybe that would be an efficient way to <laughs> move forward if you're willing. Well, I'd like to know who's been approaching him, where would industry, I mean, Alan will tell me too, and Taylor would too. Taylor's very upfront about everything. Mayor, Councilman DeSisio, perhaps while Taylor walks to the, the podium, yeah. I will say that Taylor Earl, on behalf of Lennar Holmes, uh, um, oh. was the entity who brought that forward okay. uh, during the time period when uh, Councilwoman Williams was, was the mayor. I got it. I, I'm supportive of it because I think it's a good model, but I also, you know, I'm always curious as to how some of these things come about, just like Jim was doing there. Uh, the other thing that I think we need to think about, too, is the fact that um, the um, when you have a mother-in-law set up or families so we have aging parents a lot of individuals want to be able to keep their parents in their home it's not just about the multi-generational and the kids staying at the home longer which i hope my kids stay for a long time i like that i want them there mm -hmm. but on the same level you you know more and more individuals are taking care of their parents and by doing that, they've got to have a, be able to separate that from the other parts of the family for privacy for both sides. And I get it. it. It's just literally adapting to what's happening in the marketplace today. So I want to thank you, Alan, for all the hard work you put out, on the, especially on these types of things. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. We have opened the public hearing and welcome Taylor Earl. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mayor, members of council. Um, I'll keep my remarks short. Sounds like some of the questions resolved, but I'm happy to answer any from maybe a boots on the ground perspective. But uh, but Lennar Homes does have a product that they have for multi-generational housing called NextGen. And one of the problems is that, you know, it's already, a being, it's already allowed in the city of Phoenix. I think that's just key to highlight. Already allowed, functioning, working great, been very successful. People really love it. Uh, we're at a time in our, in our society, in the country, that about 19% of families live in multi-generational housing. And that percentage has increased from about the 1980s and has continued to climb. Um, and so currently in the city of Phoenix, you can have you, know, you can have a microwave, you can have the, the kitchen, you can have the refrigerator, you can have an outdoor grill, you can have a toaster oven, you can have all of these things, but it's that one, that, little, that oven. And, and what we're finding is that some individuals, one of the constraints of not wanting to come live with their kids is the freedom, the freedom of being able to cook when they want to cook, bake a pie when they want to bake a pie. And that was becoming one of those kind of things that was becoming an issue. And so as we talked to individuals, in fact, one of the village members uh, specifically said, we looked at having my mom come and live with us in one of these types of units, but the constraint was she wanted to be able to have her own little area that she could cook. Um, and so we see it as because it's all already allowed, and this is a very small incremental step, we think it's a very reasonable and appropriate way to address the concern that exists, the, the existing need that exists. And so we, we commend staff, we've worked with staff, we've given our feedback, um, sort of boots on the brown, ground perspective. Um, was approved by all the different villages. And so we think this is a responsible way to address a concern that exists in our, in our country, but also in the city. Oh, Mayor, may I, just one more comment. Hey, Councilman DeCicio. I don't think that, you know, I've got aging parents or parent right now. And until you have that, you just don't know. And, you know, you do want to be a good family member. You want to be a good son or daughter. And you really want them as close to you as possible. And sometimes you're prevented by doing that. So I, I'm going to be fully supportive of this. Uh, I like the idea of being able to have your family members in your home, but at the same time, most families do want to see a separation, and this allows that to occur. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman. We will close the public hearing. I think Councilwoman Stark may have a motion. I would, and I want to thank Trish for all the hard work you did on this. I know you're really respectful of the neighborhoods and thinking this through. And I can't wait for one of my kids to buy one of these as I age, because <laughs> I'm getting there. So I, I would like um, to move approval of this item based on the approval of the May 7th Planning and Economic Development um, meeting and adopt the related ordinance. Second. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. DeCicio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Stark? Yes. Williams? I want to thank staff for working on this. Um, I'm a firm believer, having had parents move in with me, the separation would have been great. Uh, I love them dearly. However, they were real tired of me. Yes. <laughs> Waring? Gallego? Yes. Passes unanimously. Thanks for your hard work on this one. We now move to item 178, the northwest corner of 39th Avenue and Vineyard Road. We have a brief staff report on this item. 
Mayor, members of council, uh, I do have a PowerPoint, but I think everyone's good on this, so I'll just read the, the brief paragraph and then we'll, uh, we'll go from there. This request is a rezoning request for the northeast corner of 39th Avenue and Vineyard. It is a request from S1 to R16 for single family residential development for an 11.2 acre site. The Levine Village Planning Committee heard this case on March 18th and recommended approval for the staff recommendation with modified and additional stipulations by a 10 to 1 vote. The Planning Commission heard this case on April 4th, recommended denial as filed and approved with R18 zoning. Uh, with the Levine Village Planning Committee stipulations, uh, some were modified and, and changed as part of that. Uh, as it came forward, there was still concerns from the, the Village Planning Committee and others in Levine, and Councilman Nowakowski uh, asked that the applicant and staff uh, sit down and try and work out uh, some of the issues. And so there was a, a memo that came out as part of the backup packet yesterday that is in agreement by both the neighbors uh, and the applicant. Uh, and staff does recommend approval uh, per that memo. We're happy to answer any questions. Wonderful, thank you. Mayor, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yep. This item is in Councilman Nowakowski's district. Council no, no, go ahead, you can close the hearing in. We, I think I've not even opened the hearing yet. Should we do, um, do you wanna test, uh, make, make some comments or open the hearing? We have three oh, cards. You can go ahead and open the hearing. We open the public hearing. We have three individuals here to testify. Uh, we'll start with the applicant, if that works for Councilman Nowakowski. John Fox. Yeah, Mayor, Mayor and Council, I'm, I'm John Fox, and we've been working very, very hard on this project. I would like to defer my time to after the, um, after, the after the others speak, so I can answer anything that they From have. From our Levine Village Planning Commission, then we will welcome Robert Branscombe. And we appreciate everyone and their patience in making it through our council meeting to today's item. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Councilmen, and women. My name is Robert Branscombe. I am the chairman for the Levine Planning Commission. I'm here to speak on behalf of this approval for this uh, project. Uh, even though we worked really hard to get to the point we're at now, uh, we appreciate all the help that uh, Councilman Nowakowski and his staff has gone before. Uh, one of the things that we try to do as far as the council is make sure that our projects are worthy of the city and our community. And this is no exception. Uh, when you do an infill project, it's always very hard to try to put the right pieces in place to do that. Uh, I believe now that with the councilman's help and uh, the staff that we got to a place that we can and, and appreciate uh, the project that he's bringing before us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil Hertel. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. First of all, I want to take just a moment to thank Councilwoman Mendoza for all of your work in Levine. We appreciate all you've done. You've been a great asset for the community, and thank you very much. Um, so, yes, and I, and I want to thank Councilman Nowakowski and his office for this working on this case. It's been very challenging and difficult, and there's been a lot of effort and a lot of energy the planning department and the the um, the council office and staff invited the LCRD and the village planning committee to come and sit down and try to work out details. We did. We sat down. We worked them out. It wouldn't have happened without the city's effort in the eleventh hour to try to get this case resolved. And so I just want to say I appreciate that, and it just shows how this will work if we all try to work together, and where this case is at. With all the stipulations that have been created, I have no opposition to it moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Probably good that we saved that uh, the applicant for last, John Fox. Yes, I'm John Fox. I'm the applicant on this on this site, and I appreciate the support of the of the village and the LCRD, and uh, we look forward to moving working with them closely. Uh, they will have another opportunity to review this site plan before it's approved with the uh, zoning hearing officer. So they'll, they'll be able to have input on this further. So thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you. Councilman Nowakowski, any comments or a motion? Yes, oh. Mayor, some comments? Close the public hearing. All right, thank you, Mayor. Mayor, first of all, I just really wanna thank our staff and um, the village uh, representatives, especially the chair for his patience with the process and and working along with us and Phil thank you so much for 
be, uh, representing the community well out there. Also, um, I just want to make a motion that we approve um, per the uh, memo from the Planning and Development um, Department directed um, date, I think it was June 3rd of 2019 to be adopted as um, stated earlier. Mayor Council Wachowski, and also adopt the related ordinance. And the ordinance also. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any comments? Roll call. DeCicio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Waring, yes. Gallego. Yes, passes unanimously. This concludes the formal business of today's meeting. Thank you to our councilwomen who have served with us. It has been a pleasure to serve with both of you. We still have public comments, so we are not done, but did want to say thank you. And as we conclude the formal business, um, as has been our tr um, trend lately, we have what the city has allocated uh, 30 minutes for public comment. We allocate more time for public comment than we do on each agenda uh, item, but we do try to hear from as many people as possible. Uh, lately, we have been getting more comments than would be able to fit in that 30 minutes, so we apologize if not everyone gets to speak. We'll try to get to as many different topics as possible. Um, we have some people who have put in cards in support of someone else's comments, so I will try to read the number of other people who are saying, echoing that person's comments. Uh, for public comment, we are not allowing people to donate time to others, and we, look, uh, we do allow three minutes, which is longer than we do for other items to give you time to, to make your comment. Uh, so with that, our first public comment today will be David Perez Lucero. And David will be followed by Carolyn O'Connor. Hello, Mayor and City Council. My name is David Perez Lucero. I am the president of the newly formed Neighborhood Association in Central East Phoenix, uh, District 8. I am here before you to request a waiver on the fee of $2,760 for an appeal of a variance decision rendered last Thursday in regarding KCA 199 19.8. Our neighborhood is not supportive of the decision. The variances passed will create traffic issues and on-street parking. In addition, after perusing the file yesterday, I found that our neighborhood documents were not included in the file. Uh, an exhibit was presented in the hearing that um, we are suspicious of we, uh, as to its validity. We are hoping to make a determination after conducting a investigation uh, to uh, proceed onward on the appeal. I would appreciate your support and thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, and we cannot respond to public comments, but we can see if staff can follow up. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn will be, uh, has three, three individuals who have filled out cards in support of the comments she is about to deliver. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council members. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. My name is Carolyn O'Connor. I am the co-chair of Uncage and Reunite Family Coalition. We are a grassroots organization that came together a year ago when children were being separated from their parents at the border while they were legally seeking asylum in the United States. Uncage and Reunite advocates for the safety, health, and well-being of immigrant children while in the custody of the United States. I know you are aware of the increase of ICE, ICE migrant releases in the community. Until they can be connected with family or sponsors, which could take up to several hours, it has been up to community nonprofits and faith-based organizations to provide shelter, transportation, food, and other services. Often these drop-offs occur with little uh, advanced notification. These organizations and churches are overburdened. We volunteers are exhausted. Resources are running out. If a church or an organization is not available, ICE will drop refugee families off at the Greyhound bus station. Since Greyhound does not allow passengers to enter the facility until they have a ticket, 
and then only two hours before departures, families are dropped off at the water retention basin adjacent to the bus station. There is little shade, no facilities, and until volunteers can come to the rescue, they are forced to sit on the ground in the heat. Often refugees that arrive are dehydrated and hungry. As the temperature continues to, ri to rise, we are concerned this is a fatality waiting to happen. There have already been several deaths in the ICE facilities. Certainly, the city of Phoenix, often named the All-American City, does not want to tarnish its reputation with preventable death of a child or a parent. This is not just a humanitarian crisis. This is a moral issue. There are some community organizations that can accommodate large groups of refugees, such as St. Vincent de Paul. So we have a blueprint for what works. Is there something the city of Phoenix could do to provide another avenue other than water retention basin as a drop off for refugees? It could be a large air conditioned facility that would act as an intake center, at least until the summer's over. As I said, we have a blueprint for what works. Phoenix is the only Arizona city where migrant families are being released by federal without a centralized location to house migrants overnight. In Yuma, the Border Patrol has been releasing migrant families at a shelter run by the Salvation Army. In Tucson, federal authorities are releasing migrants at a shelter run by Catholic Community Services. I thank you for your time and I have one request. Several of our members are citizens of Phoenix and they will be contacting their uh, contacts in hope that we can generate further discussion with this. Just as a side note, a group of us were standing outside 15 minutes waiting for your building to open. We had water, we had shade. In 15 minutes, the heat really got to us. Thank you. Thank you. Kat McKinney, followed by Sarah Erie. Thank you, Council, for allowing me these few moments. I am Kat McKinney, and I am the voice of several victims of police brutality here in Phoenix, Arizona. We have just recently, you know, Phoenix has been labeled as being the number one police killing department in the country. And I think this is something that's very important and something that we need to address. I am uh, working on much advocacy in regards to this. One of the things that's happening is we will have the United Nations coming in here. They have labeled this a humanitarian crisis and we need to address it. My question and I know you can't answer, but it's something that you can think about, is why do we deliberately delay compensation to victims of these crimes? These families have been harbored for years. I know today in Begbu, who was uh, one of my clients, his case was put off again today. This case and his murder happened five years ago. His family is still awaiting their compensation. Now, another thing that um, I wanted to do is I want to read what a humanitarian crisis is so that we can actually understand the importance of this. It says a humanitarian crisis is defined as an event or series of events that are threatening in terms of health, safety, or well-being of a community or large group of people. It also states that local, national, and international responses are necessary. I'm representing a very large part of our community here in Phoenix and we would like for you to address this 
immediately. These things, these problems, they need to be addressed immediately. No longer can we ignore them. We'll be having a protest this Friday in regards to some of the officers that have been charged with uh, being racist uh, on, on Facebook. I don't know if anyone has seen that press release yet, but that will be this Friday. And I thank you for your time. But please know that this is very important to the, to, to, to the community, your community, our community, the community you represent, and the community I'm up here talking for right now. We thank you for your urgent uh, responses. Thank you. Sarah will be followed by Celia Contreras. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Erie. I am the program coordinator for the Asylum Seeker Program for Lutheran Social Services of the Southwest. And I am here to give you a wake-up call. As you know, a widespread coalition of more than 40 churches, dozens of nonprofits, and hundreds of volunteers have shouldered the burden to shelter thousands of people who have been lawfully released into our community every day for the last nine months, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, every single day, hundreds of people. We have done this without one cent of support from the city, from the county, from the state, or from the federal government. It is by God's grace alone that we have not had fatalities in this community. There's a reason we don't see a headline that says a two-year-old child dies of dehydration in a ditch after being released by ICE in Phoenix, Arizona. There's a reason for that. And the reason is because of the good people in this community who are defying that, who are saying, we will not let that happen. And it's time that you help us. When a church doesn't offer shelter, people are relegated to the ditch on 24th and Buckeye. And what we're saying is that this is not an acceptable alternative. I want you to know that in my position, I have a unique position in this crisis. Perhaps more than any other individual in this city, I have been working on this for full time since January. And I know this crisis inside and out. And I have spoke with city, county, state, and federal officials. And we all agree that it's not going away. And we all agree that people are fragile and that this has absolutely nothing to do with immigration because these people have been sorted and sifted by the good people on the Border Patrol and documented as safe to travel in our community. And when we allow them to languish in a ditch by the hundreds, then we are neglecting our humanitarian duty to see that they have safe passage. And what does that mean? A bowl of soup and a backpack and a shelter for the night. These are not difficult things to do. But you have been silent. This county has been silent. The state has been silent. And the federal government has been silent. I want you to know that this coalition is collapsing under the strain. We are losing churches every day. And we are not able to replace them. And I'm telling you, we are weeks away from an emergency. I am meeting with emergency management officials on Friday in our capacity as the emergency management nonprofit of Phoenix, of the state of Arizona. I am meeting with them on Friday about just this issue. And I'm asking for two things from the city council. One, we need an ordinance that says that, that the federal government may not release people into the street during the summer. These, you, these people are being put at fatal risk. That's number one. Number two, I'm asking for a subcommittee to be created by this council to address this issue and analyze this issue and come up with a resource for ICE. Because if we don't come up with something, they're going to continue to drop them there. We have to come up with something. This is a wake-up call. Thank you. Thank you. Celia will be followed by Leonard Clark. Thank you, all of you. Um, it's not in my name. 
I don't come in in my name. At this, time, at this time, I'm coming in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have a message for you. The Lord said, you don't understand my message. The four lanes or no train is created for me. If you don't stop the light rail, the punishment come over you. Because this battle is not going to fight with sword or with army, but my Holy Ghost. The Lord want to stop the punishment about you, upon you. But if you don't understand, he's going to continue. The next letter that I want to provide to you, I don't bring it to you because I want to cast to you pain or because I want to fight with you. But I bring it here in obedience because obedience is better sacrifice. Claire? The Lord said, mine is the earth and everything inside. Mine is the gold and the silver. And I don't put any, anything about the pain of the people that you cast already. Because you remove from the hands of the people the way that these people provide for his families. And I am wake up already. And I'm going to decline, decline the light rail. Stop the light rail. And I'll stop the next actions. That documental is a vision. It's like conversation. Where come next? And it's easy to prove the next actions. They're coming in two people here. One here and one outside. And you're going to see it. Thank you and God bless you. Leonard Clark will be followed by Redeem Robinson. My name is Leonard Clark. I want to thank our uh, community of humanitarian aid workers, whether they be Christian, Muslim, Hindu, uh, whether you don't believe in God or do believe in God for helping those people who are here, legal asylumese, legal asylumese. Um, this president is trying to exacerbate pain and suffering and hate between groups of people by dumping off human beings who are asylumese into our community. Um, and it's only going to get worse because, you know, there was an, uh, an admiral, a retired admiral, or uh, I believe a former national security official, saying that if we don't change the effects of man-made global climate change, we're looking at roughly 2050, but it could be faster, uh, that half of the rainfall that's falling in, like, the uh, Mexico City area, those areas is going to decline by half. Is it? And uh, people, when you have millions and millions of people, I had a military history professor once at U of A say there's, almost, like, over a billion people on the other side of the border, and, you know, we have to work at this. It's a large, large problem. And also, now, now I want to bring up another thing. I want to thank the former mayor of Phoenix, Greg Stanton, only member of the Arizona congressional delegation to stand for the opening of an impeachment inquiry. Thank you for showing moral courage, former mayor Greg Stanton, only member of the Democratic delegation to stand up, I guess, unfortunately right now. Uh, and also, I'm asking you, if you could, council members, because a large, a large member of your constituents, of course, we're in political districts for the state legislature, the governor of Arizona has yet to sign the 50% pay increase that the state legislature, Democrats and Republicans, voted for themselves, doing an end run around the state constitution. Governor Ducey has yet to sign that bill. And I get it, they need more pay, but not by going around the constitution. So that's going towards Democrats and Republicans. I'm hoping you will make a statement to the governor of Arizona, he has three or four days left where basically this bill could die, where the Democrats and the Republicans, uh, with a handful in both parties voting against, just voted themselves a 50% pay increase, a violation of the state constitution of Arizona. So I hope you'll send a resolution to Governor Ducey. Don't do this, Governor Ducey. You will also be breaking the state constitution if you do it. And once again, thank you, Mayor Greg Stanton, Congressman, all the other Congress people, please follow Congressman 
Greg Stantons and uh, Lead, and thank you to our Christian brothers and sisters for standing up and helping those in need and not being afraid of those who would have pistols on their hips and trump flags showing up to churches uh, trying to scare you. Thank you. Redeem Robinson. Jarrett Maupin. Well, thank you, Mayor and Council. I wanted to come back to continue on what I was talking about uh, earlier. Uh, the statistic I didn't have handy was uh, the breakdown of the department, that it's 73% white, the police department, 19% um, Hispanic, and 4% black, uh, compared with the city, which is 42% white, 43% Hispanic, and 7% black. Now, you know, it's a three-point spread on the blacks in the department versus the population, but it's off by more than 24% when it comes to Latinos. Uh, that is just not a healthy and, uh, and, and maintainable thing. Um, you know, I did want to clarify too, because I felt like maybe the mayor was a little bit upset. I don't know what happened. I just got through voting for you. Um, but um, my, uh, you know, my grandmother uh, was one of the first African-American women hired to work for the Phoenix Police Department before she went to work for the city manager. Uh, and there we have, I have relatives now that work for the police department and almost two dozen of my family members work for the city of Phoenix. So I care. Um, and I think we do have a great police department. I think the vast majority of our police do a great job and they want to get home safe to their family members. But there, there's a, there's a few bad apples, few, few, uh, heaping helpings of bad apples that are, that are making it a hell of a lot harder for the rest of them to do their, do their job. But I, I, I want to clarify that because I think sometimes you all might think that the community doesn't support raises for police. We do. I've been over in the plea office with Sal uh, to support them a hundred times. Anytime they want, we're over there to support what they're doing. And, I, and uh, you know, I think that uh, uh, it's not that. It's the incidences of racism, uh, of brutality and the, the impact that it's having on these families. I want to say with my last minute that, you know, I appreciate the mayor's comments about trying to get on TV, but Madam Mayor, I am on TV several times a week. They usually come to my house. I don't even have to get dressed sometimes. The thing is, you know, I love this city and I want us to have a good reputation. And right now it's hurting. It's really hurting all over this country. And we have to do something about it. And that might mean firing some of these officers. That might mean publishing the Brady List. That might mean doing some reasonable things. I think there's a lot of reasonable things we can do, nonviolent, peaceful, you know, collaborative things we can do. We just got to be like uh, Sal DeCici, I'll make him the example today, and be able to engage in a conversation, even if you disagree with people. It's how me and Plea get along. Really, at the end of the day, if they need my help, I'm there to help them because they're respectful. Thank you. Thank you. Jaden Contreras. Corinita Contreras. Yaritza Contreras. We are adjourned.